Yeah. Wow. Okay. And um, what did you uh, get your first PhD in? Uh, well, I only had one PhD. Um, last I checked. Um, <laughs> My original degree is in philosophy, um, but then uh, there's not a lot of jobs in philosophy, and so um, I uh, yeah my my dad as a colonel in the army was not a big fan of me studying philosophy, and he kept saying you know I looked in the paper there's no jobs for philosophers I said well dad they're there they're just under uh, landscaping and fast food he didn't think that was all that funny I was amused by it but he turned out to be right damn it and so I. Um, kind of talked my way into grad school in clinical psych and ended up loving it. And uh, I've been doing that ever since. Technically, s- yeah, technically, you might say I, I have a, a second PhD because um, when you get a black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, they call you professor after that. And it takes about 10 to 12 years to get a black belt. So it's really actually longer to get a black belt than to get a PhD in, in academic work. Is that um, related to capoeira, uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu? No, capoeira is more dance-like. Um, capoeira, um, it was actually a martial art that was kind of uh, designed uh, where people could train in it and look like they were dancing, but then use it in combat. Um and uh, it's lots of handstands and stuff like that. And I suck at handstands. Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is a, a, a modified version of um, uh, Japanese Jiu-Jitsu, very related to Judo. That's all about the ground game. And um, uh, UFC actually started with um, the Gracie family, who uh, basically invented Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. When they came up into L.A., the UFC was started, and MMA really grew out of that. What's the uh, added flavor or uh, stresses uh, upon the movements that make it distinct Brazilian from Japanese? Uh, Japanese Jiu-Jitsu is a lot more standing. Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is very on the ground. Um, and like, like rolling around on the ground. Is that what you yeah. mean? Okay. Yeah. It's very, it's very, yeah. Every fist fight I've ever been in ended up pretty quickly with two idiots on the ground rolling around. Now I'm happy on the ground. Um, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu also, it's a little, it's less stylized than most of the Japanese uh, or Asian martial arts. Um, it doesn't have, you know, katas, for instance. Um, it is very, uh, it's very grappling based. I mean, it's not, it, it's not, it, it's not very formalized um, in the movements. I mean, there are lots of moves, but you, um, it, it, it is a lot closer to a real fight, to be honest. So it's it's not um uh, it's less aesthetic. It's more like power and leverage and getting your way right away. Yeah, it really is. Yeah, yeah. When you choke somebody in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, they know they've been choked. Okay. Until they don't know anything anymore. <laughs> yeah, I made a guy pass out once and it scared the shit out of me. Oh really? Yeah, I thought I broke his brain. He started seizing, oh, and he no. woke up. It was his birthday, too, and and he woke up, and he was all happy. He said it was one of the best experiences of his life. Um, Well, you gave him, like, a uh, rebirth, near-death experience. guy. (laughs) Never the same after that. (laughs) Totally. So what did you end up specializing in uh, clinical psychology? Or, yeah. Um, Well, I actually started working around um, sexuality issues pretty early on, um, working with sex offenders for a number of years and um, started working with adolescent sex offenders and then worked with adult sex offenders for a while. Um, There's there's always work in that line of business um, if you can tolerate it. Not a lot of therapists. Yeah, not a lot of therapists are interested in working with that population. Um, I was fine with it because I had a good poker face and and I could sort of understand the humanity of people that um, you know commit sexual crimes and and violations of consent. I'm not excusing it, but I could understand how they got there. and uh, then over time, I ended up working more with alternative sexual 
sexual practices, non-monogamy, kink, and stuff like that. You know, one reason my last name lay, I had to be a sex doctor. But then um, what I started seeing was people would, therapists would refer sexual issues to me that weren't necessarily um, that, you know, they weren't criminal. They weren't, they weren't abused, but they were slightly outside the norm. And I came to realize that most therapists have absolutely no training in sexuality. And that's a, it's a dirty secret that not a lot of people really kind of understand is that most psychotherapists in the United States um, get almost no training on sexuality. And um, it, it's sort of a tragedy because people who have more sex live longer. Um, couples that have more sex um, and are more sexually compatible are healthier, happier relationships. But we just aren't trained to talk about it. And so most therapists then judge sexuality um, by what, what I call the Kinsey scale, you know, the Kinsey style, um, not zero to six, gay to straight. But Kinsey said that the definition of an nymphomaniac or a sex addict in today's language is anybody who has more sex than therapist. So if the th if your patient is getting laid more than you, I tell therapists clearly there's something wrong with the patient, not you, right? Um, so most therapists are judging sexuality based solely on their own experience or what they've seen in social media, because again, most therapists are also not reading scientific literature, um, which has led to, you know, uh, sexuality, um, the therapy field, mental health therapy field being incredibly judgmental and biased around sexuality. I mean, it's not by accident that the American Psychiatric Association viewed homosexuality as a mental illness up until 1973. Mm -hmm. um, we have a really long history of, of our field being very biased and conservative around sexuality. And um, that's one of the things that I kind of fell into and have developed kind of a passion for for challenging mm -hmm. the apa has loosened its uh what uh what's it called when when you say something's a disorder um diagnosis uh, or diagnosis but negative uh i guess uh no, oh, the pathology, pa pathologization. So they, um, they've stopped pathologizing homosexuality and started pathologizing masculinity yeah, kind of. Yeah. Now, uh, two different APAs. So the APA uh, with, with diagnosis and homosexuality, that's the Psychiatric Association. They govern um, uh, the what's called the big book of you know the, uh, the DSM, Diagnostic yeah. Statistic Manual of, of Psychiatric Disorders. Um, it was the American Psychological Association a couple of years ago that put out this very, I think, short-sighted and, and uh, uh, dismaying kind of um, guidelines around treating masculinity. And, you know, I, I, I'm not a member of the APA. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you one in a sec. But I, um, uh, it was, I found those guidelines just really troubling because they, they ignore the fact that, you know, assertiveness and dominance and single-mindedness, passion to change things and make a name for yourself are things in masculinity that have changed the world. I mean, we, we exist in a world with automobiles and, and vaccines and, and antibiotics because of much of that, you know, those qualities. And 70 to 90 percent of therapists and psychologists are female. And so when we put out guidelines like that, we are encouraging female therapists to, unfortunately, um, you know, engage in behaviors that can be shaming and judging and stigmatizing towards males. Most males don't want to go to therapy. And that's kind of one of the reasons why is that they, they, they can often feel judged and misunderstood. Um, in couples therapy, it's fascinating. Um, I talk about the fact that females in couples therapy, thinking heterosexual couples, um, females hold a significant level of privilege because most couples therapists are female and most couples therapy practices are designed to teach men to kind of act or interact a little bit more like women, Com um, communicating their feelings, talking about their emotions, listening. These are all wonderful, good things. But men walk into couples therapy um, at a significant disadvantage, not having been taught to practice those skills from an early age, the way females have. 
Are there uh, therapeutic skills that men can learn that uh, is more are more natural to them than listening and being emotional? Yeah. Um, so when when guys you know come to me for therapy, I will often say to them. Um, look, we can, we can go at this in two different ways. We can um, try to talk and understand what's at the root of these issues and help you understand what's going on here, develop insight, or I can just start giving you some techniques that if you follow them, things will start changing. And overwhelmingly, most guys will say, ah, let's just let's just start swapping parts out, you know, let, let, let change the carburetor, see if that fixes it. Right. However, as we do that, guys are as we're talking about uh, these techniques or strategies, whether it's mindfulness or thought switching or, you know, cognitive behavioral strategies for depression and anxiety, as we start implementing and talking about those, the men start developing the insight that we were working towards in the other option as well. Yeah. So what I what I talk with guys about, I mean, I think one of the one of the most important things is um Developing a diversity of coping strategies and even recognizing the need to cope. Um, depression and anxiety, um, men are not taught oftentimes to express or acknowledge a range of emotions and then um, to identify the need to cope with them. So guys oftentimes have a very limited kind of range of coping strategies, you know, um, alcohol um, and interestingly, porn and masturbation. Um are some of the ways that a lot of men cope with anxiety and depression. And then unfortunately, when guys have just one coping strategy that they overuse, they can oftentimes end up in conflicts with partner or, you know, uh, uh, it's happening less now because most guys are watching porn on their phone as opposed to the work computer. But for years, I was seeing lots and lots of men that referred to me because they'd gotten in trouble looking at porn on the work computer. And what I would find over and over and over were that was that these were guys who were highly anxious or depressed or bored. And <laughs> they looking at porn is a really effective way to change how you feel. Um, it changes, you know, how your brain is, how your brain is working right then. Cause when we're turned on our, our brain is evolved to not fucking think about the things that make us nervous because, you know, evolution just wanted you to fuck right then, not worry about a saber tooth tiger. Hmm. So, looking at porn and getting sexually turned on can make anxiety go away really effectively. It can make your depression feelings go away really effectively. But if that's the only strategy you've got to make those feelings go away and you're stressed out during a PTA meeting or, or, or at church, you need another strategy. So what that those are some of the main things that I work with guys on is just you know let, let us let us expand the strategies we have to deal with these feelings rather than unfortunately historically most treatments around these issues like sex addiction treatment particularly um, they tried to deal with these issues simply by suppressing the behavior and not building up alternative strategies. So that oftentimes as they tried to make men stop masturbating or watching porn or having sex to deal with these negative feelings, the men ended up increasingly ang anxious and depressed with greater distress because they were taking away the coping strategy but not replacing it with anything. Could you, could you define what you mean by coping or to flesh out what is the usefulness of what it is to cope with a negative feeling, let's say. What, what, what is that uh, framework that we're using when we say coping with something? Yeah. That's, a, that's a thoughtful question. I'm not sure I've ever been asked that, but let me think about it. Um, you know, to, in my frame, coping with negative emotions 
involves a bit of distancing from them in terms of recognizing that you are not that feeling, but you are a being that is experiencing that feeling. And that that feeling is an experience, but it does not dictate our actions. So that um, if you've ever heard of the the come uh, strategy, uh, the therapeutic strategy, acceptance and commitment therapy, it involves that. It involves you know, and mindfulness as well invites us to recognize that, oh, I'm feeling sad right now. Where did that feeling come from? What is that feeling about? What do I want to do with that feeling? It takes uh, coping with, in, in, in my frame in therapy, involves us taking some control mm-hmm of the role of that feeling in our life behavior and experience as opposed to letting it be in charge or alternatively using things to distract you from it or Mm -hmm. to translate it sublimate it into another energy and then evacuating it let's say that's right sure through that yeah and and you know i i have a love-hate relationship with with you know freud and freudian kind of history and therapy um you know the, freud for his day um was brilliantly insightful about a lot of things and um talked about you know when we suppress our emotions they can come squirting out when we suppress issues or conflicts that we're not dealing with in the hydraulic model they yeah. um they, they they come squirting out in in other things that look unrelated but are not but what freud really i, th- I think brilliantly pointed out is that um we need a range of kind of coping strategies and defenses and problems come up and and what 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 he called defenses i'm talking about here coping strategies problems come up when we've only got one um personality disorders in my mod in my theory um Hmm. you know whether narcissism or borderline personality disorder um um, etc these are people who overuse single or limited coping strategies okay. things that borderlines do things that people that are narcissists do healthy people do but they don't only do that so under your model or what you're bringing up when you're dealing with someone with a uh, exuberant or extreme personality disorder so-called you don't think that that's hardwired into them. It's just they haven't developed, uh, I guess, differentiated different kind of social strategies and, uh, I guess, meaning making operations in order to you know deal with other people, conceptualize other people, so on and so forth. Or are they there's something in the wiring that they need to actually intentionally work on to kind of overcome. Uh, both. I mean, um, I, I I get criticized as, as being a bit of a determinist and essentialist because I think we um, grossly underestimate the degree of uh, biology and, and, and genetic predisposition on our behaviors. Um, I think that hmm. the um, – but, of course, we're a person that interacts with the world from that biological predisposition. And uh, that's understanding the level of that biological predisposition on our behaviors is critical to then being able to effectively make changes. Um, So, for instance, um, uh, sexual sensation seeking is a uh, component of sexuality that leads people to engage in, you know, basically what I call adrenaline junkie sexual behaviors. They are, you know, in pursuit more of novelty, um, edge pushing kind of sexual behaviors. They want to they want to ride that that kind of thrill. It is related, highly related to people that engage in sensation seeking behaviors in general, whether it's skydiving, rock climbing, drag racing, etc. It is highly genetically heritable. 
Um, it, it also appears to significantly influence the white matter of the brain and that the brains of people with um, higher sexual sensation seeking, they need more stimulation to reach a level of satiation from an experience, right? Some people can ride a roller coaster once and they're done. Some people ride the roller coaster over and over and over again and, and, and have a great fucking time every time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If you don't know or recognize that that is a part of yourself, then it's pretty easy for you to get in a relationship, for instance, or to choose a profession that doesn't match that aspect of yourself. Hmm. If you're a high sexual sensation seeker and you commit to a monogamous relationship with somebody who is not a high sexual sensation seeker, there's going to be a conflict down the road because you want more sexual stimulation. You want more sexual adventure than they do. If you don't recognize that aspect of yourself, um, if you're an adrenaline junkie kind of person and you choose to be an accountant and you don't identify other ways in your life to accommodate that, you know, adventurousness, thrill seeking kind of aspect of yourself, you're going to run into problems in the future. Right. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the a lot of the education I do in therapy is helping people to understand themselves and then negotiate ways to accommodate their better understanding of themselves in their life. I call it when it comes to sex, I, I talk about the concept of sexual integrity, which involves you recognizing confronting accepting your sexual self and then identifying ethical consensual ways to negotiate that erotic self in your life uh you know akin to the people who you know, got married heterosexually when um, homosexuality and same-sex relationships were not accepted in our in, in our in our society. And then, as our society has changed, they've gone to their partner and said, "You know, I this is who I am. Um, I really am gay, and I really do need to experience this. But I love you, and I love our relationship. Is there a way we can negotiate this? Is there a way we can start to figure this out?" Hmm. That's the same level of very hard conversation that we have to have with each other and with ourselves as we accept who we are. That just imagining that conversation, uh, I wonder if there are coping strategies or uh, <laughs> <laughs> for for both parties in that or or the correct uh, place. Uh, and if, if a therapy, uh, somebody like you have an office where you can conduct that and how you would orchestrate such a conversation like that, where a lot of things go south or you just have to let it happen. Um, yeah, uh, you know, it's, it's, I would say coping strategies, um, or, or just, you know, skills, um, uh, you know, working with people to slow down, to allow yourself to have feelings, but again, not let those feelings dictate behavior or char you know, be in charge. Um, recognize, yeah, I met this couple once at dinner, and I want to say they were in their 90s, and they'd been married, I want to say 60 or 70 years, pretty wild. And we asked them, you know, how do you, how do you do that? I mean, just, just how, how, how the fuck do you do that? How do you stay with one, with somebody for, you know, half a century? And their answer boiled down to, at the end of the day, you have to recognize that this other person is a whole other person. And you have to decide, are you going to let them be another person or try to fit them into the box that you've created for them in your head? If we can find ways to accept each other as whole other people, um, oftentimes then we can navigate more win-win kind of relationships, accommodate differences, um, Except. Hmm. 
The one persistent question I have, or that I find very rich, especially around therapy and all the different professions that are associated with that, is how morality informs or uh, or uh, blocks progress and how do you just become amoral is there no such thing as morality when we're talking about accepting ourselves and yeah. you brought up the process of acceptance mm -hmm. and then ethical decisions and stuff and especially around sexuality mm -hmm. and especially around the uh, fringier sexualities morality gets really tight which i think m is it seems to me that that's necessary for a social taboo mm -hmm. to keep society in line but that causes some pretty severe disruptions for people who are, let's say, baked in a certain direction. Right. So when you're interacting with that, where does the morality come in? Do you suspend that so you can just see? Like you said something about a poker face. And then at what point do you have to go back to yourself and say, that was really messed up, but my job's not to judge. So you don't judge, but you do judge. I don't know. It's just such a... Yeah. Um, you know, so... It, Interestingly, I mean, I uh, a couple of hours ago, I was in a, a supervision session with a with a, a female therapist. I, I supervise and train to be to be a sex therapist, and she had just had the experience that happens actually to unfortunately to a lot of female sex therapists, where a guy um, pretended to uh, want a consult with her um, and then started talking about sex stories and everything else during this during this discussion mm -hmm. and then stood up and was naked and was masturbating. And she had had a sense early on that there is something going south here, but she she was trying to be non-judgmental and she was trying to be non-shaming and as a result ended up um, this guy taking advantage. So being non-judgmental and being non-shaming, you're right, can absolutely be a problem. And, um, you know, I, I disagree with the concept or, or the term minor attracted person, because while I recognize that uh, there is every likelihood that people with pedophilia and sexual attraction to children are born that way, that it really is hardwired. I dislike the term minor attracted person because it minimizes the fact that this is a non-consensual and criminal behavior that is likely to result in some levels of, of harm uh, to the children. And the minor attracted person, I, I like the idea of reducing stigma around this issue so that people can get help. But I also think it's one of the places where we sound crazy and when we try to ignore the, the, the fact that there are some real significant problems here. What I one of the one of the issues that and, 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 and I am a huge actual critic of the intrusion of morality and, bi and, and social bias into sex therapy in particular. Um, the, be, because, uh, you know, the, my book, The Myth of Sex Addiction, really argues that the concept of sex addiction is just applying religious, heteronormative, monogamy-focused um, social ideals in a way that typically stigmatized is masculine sexuality. 95% of sex addicts are men, and most of them are men who are acting in very masculine sexual manner that is judged unhealthy and inappropriate because of morality. Are you saying that men are slut-shamed, but it's, it's dressed up in very uh, professional yeah. language? Absolutely. I mean, um, it's not by accident that, you know, the the criteria for sex addiction are consistently behavior, sexual behaviors that men engage in more than women. Um, masturbation, watching pornography, um, uh, sex with people they don't know, casual sex, infidelity. Um, these are all the criteria for sex addiction, and they all just happen to be the things that men do more around sex than, hmm. than women. And so the, the concept of sex addiction, just like the American Psychological Association's statement on masculinity, is wanting men to be sexually more like women. But the stigma is a, it's a 
social construct. It is a social construct and it has uses to regulate behaviors in order to diminish chaos on a social level. If you can restrain certain drives that men have, certain drives that women tend to have and kind of shame these different things or at least cast them as negative, society functions that way. The clinical mindset is different than the social mindset and when they get mixed up in the wrong way, then we have... Uh, a society that celebrates and embraces every variation of sexuality out in the open when that's not necessarily good. Let's just say a child being taken to a pride parade and watching right. a bunch of men being walked around like they're dogs or something like that. Um, so it, it's just, I think a lot of uh, the laymen or people outside of it, or like I can just, see, there's just a lot of tension there. And, there and putting on a and, hat and taking off yeah. the hat when we're talking yeah. about these things. And, and, it is a fairy tale to think that if we just remove shame around these issues, that all problems will go away, um, that everybody will re behave responsibly and ethically. Because there are lots of irresponsible and unethical people out there who, um, just like the therapist I mentioned, will take advantage of you or take advantage of other people um, if you you know remove that shame. So what I historically the concept of sexual health was based on hmm. what you do okay so that uh, it was an act-based model of, of of sexual health identifying what is sexually healthy so historically you know heterosex was healthy homosex was unhealthy sex within marriage was healthy sex outside marriage was unhealthy penis and vagina sex was healthy but penis and anus or mouth or anywhere else sex was unhealthy it was called sodomy we, we, we judged sex, whether a sexual behavior was healthy or not by what it was. Now, as we are moving towards a more sophisticated, nuanced kind of level and recognizing that there are lots of healthy people out there having oral sex or anal sex, so then what changes? Well, what changes is we start to now talk about it's not what you do, but it's how you do it. So can you engage in that behavior in a manner that evokes what we call the six principles of sexual health, where there is consent and honesty, mutuality, there's attention to pleasure, attention to safety, and there's no exploitation. What would, could you define exploitation in this context? Uh, taking advantage of a person against their will, using a person. So, um, okay. uh, so, so, you know, again, the man that called up my therapist and pretended to, you know, to want therapy and really he was uh, just, you know, using this for his own needs. He was exploiting her, right? Because she didn't know going in what yeah. this was. Okay. He was exploiting her goodwill. Yeah, he, he reduced her into a prostitute uh, yeah. without, against her knowledge. Absolutely. And, and the, the, the thing of it is a lot of therapists do those consults for free, right? So he was, you know, he could have paid to call a phone sex line or, a, a, you know, a, a cam girl and had that same experience, but he, he would have had to pay for it. Here he's cheating the system. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's pretty icky. I mean, on That's a number gross. of different levels. And it happens a lot. Yeah. Um, what are, which yeah. which is, you know, and, and, and while I, you know, reject the APA kind of, you know, guide on masculinity, we do have to recognize that there are some masculine behaviors like that that are gross. Now, those are human problems. But I got to tell you, I haven't worked with, you know, sex offenders for, for many, many, many years. Um, we see that kind of Machiavellianism, narcissism, selfishness. Um, are in men much more frequently. Mm -hmm. And how do you um, do you approach a man with uh, kind of that extreme of behavior, or where a lot of these uh, other personality uh, disorders or kind of negative social traits like get lodged into their sexuality? Is there ways to change men? Is that is is changing someone at all the correct way to approach that, or what? Yeah. <sighs> 
A big problem around a lot of this and going back to your social, um, you know, control kind of idea is that unfortunately when we shame people around their behaviors and they end up hating themselves and they end up hating themselves such that it is more difficult for them to control their behavior hmm. that you know, shame actually, you know, shame leads to people trying not to think about something. And as a result, thinking about it more, it, it increases in kind of power. There's, there's a, a researcher I refer to often, Yanni Bifradi is an Israeli researcher and he, he did this interesting study where he looked at highly orthodox um, religious people and found that the more religious they were, the more they tried not to think about masturbation. And the more they tried not to think about masturbation, the more they thought about masturbation, right? And the more they thought about it, the more they hated themselves. And then the more they hated themselves, the more they thought about it, right? So there is this shame spiral hmm. that um, gets in the way of these, uh, of, of, of making kind of healthy decisions, um, engaging in healthy sexual behavior. So the historically uh most treatment of sex offenders has been extremely paternalistic and shaming very confrontational um and interestingly research now is finding that most of those methods of treatment of sex offenders make the problem worse they may actually incentivize or increase recidivism. Because again, if you're telling a guy, and I've seen this, if you're telling a guy that he is scum, will always be scum, he can never be accepted, the only, only way he can move forward in life is to hate himself and to cut parts of himself out. There's a point at which that guy says, why do I care anymore? Okay. They, 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 they stop having empathy for society um, and, and, and they're already isolated and stigmatized. I mean, registered sex offenders, you know, they, they, they can't drive through a school zone accidentally without, without potentially going to jail. Um, they, you know, they, they, you know the, the probation officers come to their houses on Halloween night to make sure they're not, you know, giving out candy to kids we create this horrific level of, of shame and isolation that probably makes it worse. Hmm. Um, and understanding how people came to be that way, understanding that if they are a pedophile or have pedophilic tendencies, there's a very significant level of that that is biologically driven. And, and if we can understand that in ourself, um, does it potentially lead to the ability to make healthier choices? Um, a guy, young college kid came to me and um, he was really upset about his sexual fantasies. He uh, fantasized and was really turned on by rough sex porn. And he had a, his main fantasy was having rough oral sex with a woman, you know, pardon my French, you know, face fucking her and until tears ran down her face. And he, and he really fetishized kind of, if she's got mascara, you know, running down her face. And the guy, guy was a feminist. He was, he was highly focused on egalitarianism and, um, and supporting female rights and autonomy. And he thought that having that fantasy made him a rapist and a bad person. And so instead, I talked about the fact that, you know, there are women out there where that's their fantasy too. Your job is to find one of those women hmm. and not engage in that behavior with a woman where that's not her fantasy or it's not consensual. Hmm. So that, again, is that level of kind of sexual self-acceptance and then honest ethical negotiation in life. Is there, I mean, I, it's all dependent on the person and the discussion and the, right. and uh, their, and their abilities, their ability yeah. to have that kind of self-awareness and exert, you know, um, uh, self-control and, and planning on behavior. I, I was just thinking, is there a reason why he has those, uh, that fantasy is that fantasy, like kind of 
uh, actually like his subconscious telling him something about himself uh, do do you do you ever take that tack to like do it some would of be depth so, stuff? so it would be nice if we could answer that question but here's yeah. the here's the the fascinating thing is at this point we genuinely have no idea why people are sexually aroused by the things that they're aroused by we why people end up with certain fantasies um there is a significant level we think of taboo in driving what we react to so justin lay miller is a, a sexual researcher a very good friend of mine he has a lovely book called tell me what you want and he talks about the fact that in his research um, Democrats are more likely to sexually fantasize about bondage and discipline. And he says Republicans are more likely to fantasize about infidelity and cuckolding. Because in, in the Democrat world, you know, egalitarianism and being, you know, being respectful to each other and not dominating each other is the ideal. And so they fantasize about that taboo. And in the Republican world, you know, being a male whose wife would never cheat on him um, and they call each other cucks if they're not, you know, uh, if they're not true enough to 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 the ideals and principles. And then you've got people like Jerry Falwell Jr., you know, getting exposed, watching his wife have sex with the pool boy. Is it in part are our sexual fantasies in part in response to the things that we're not allowed to have? Um, uh, Orthodox Jewish men in New York City, um, when they watch pornography, preferentially watch pornography of oral sex, of a woman performing oral sex on the man, because, um, you know, uh, fellatio like that is forbidden within that within that tradition. So we think that some of the things that we sexually fantasize about are in reaction to the things we can't have. Hmm. But uh, another book um, called Who's Been Sleeping in Your Head by Brett Carr, he analyzes all these sexual fantasies um, from Americans and, and UK. And he talks about this one, this one woman in the book um, that he interviewed, and she's, she's a little old Jewish grandma. And uh, the only way she could achieve orgasm while masturbating was to fantasize about being strapped to a table, molested by Nazi doctors. Hmm. She watched her parents die in a, in, a, in, in a concentration camp, right? So this is a very psychologically complex fantasy. Is it healthy or unhealthy? I don't know. Is it her working through something? Maybe. Is she able to overcome that horrific experience by bringing some sexuality or eroticism to it? Maybe. Um, Dan Savage argues that. He's, he, you know, he argues that we eroticize things that we're afraid of um, because it takes away some of the sting. Maybe. Hmm. Um, but, you know, there, a lot of the people that are scared of spiders don't have sexual fantasies of spiders. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So sexuality is, sexuality is complex and it's far more complex than we give it credit for. I, sexuality is the most complex, multiply determined human behavior that exists. We can't reduce it to hmm. simple kind of black and white answers. We have to recognize that our sexuality, our fantasies, our desires, our behavior are all wrapped up in our biology, our environment, our history, our choices. Um, and, and, and we can't separate understanding sexuality without understanding the person. It just, it's always, well, not always, but it, it gives rise to the weirdest things. Uh, the fantasies, the, the things that um, become erotically charged can get very, very weird and uh, s symbolic. It really kind of shows, it's like the inverse of the religious imagination. The human beings have this wonderful capacity to imagine these, these wonderful stories and, and traditions and, and build up these things, but... The, the, the basement goes down just as deep and gets just as uh, Baroque as, as the cathedral does. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, you know, sexual, 
the, the, the same is true of violence and, you know, the, the complexity of violent fantasies and violent fiction and violent movies. I mean, um, yeah, my second book uh, called Insatiable, or no, my first book actually called Insatiable Wives. Um, it's about uh, it's about cuckolding, and it's about men who share their wives with other men. And there's a, a really significant component in that lifestyle um, around uh, black men and wanting to share the white wife with with African American men. And people ask me, well, isn't that racist? Aren't they aren't they exploiting those black men? Maybe, but, and there's certainly times that, that that is the case, but I wonder if we lived in a society that wasn't wrestling with racial issues, would people be having interracial sexual fantasies like that? I think that our fantasies reflect a lot of those conflicts and turmoil in society. Um. Hmm. as opposed to being a cause of the, uh, or, yeah, of the or, racism. Yeah, or right. a contributing factor even, perhaps. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm constantly uh, wondering when coronavirus will be eroticized by a <laughs> slew of flimboy fan art and, and the crazy mask sex and stuff like that, mm -hmm. because I know it's going to come. I know it's, it's being imprinted on a lot of people and a lot of the, um, a lot of the emotionality that's wrapped up in uh, lockdowns and mm -hmm. all the, everything associated with that. I know it's going to be, it's going to be working out uh, some, yeah. some other way, get lodged in well, people's I mean, imagination. We, yeah. We saw people eroticize HIV and, you know, people hmm. being men that were quote unquote bug chasers that sexually fantasized about, you know, trying to acquire HIV. Hmm. Um, and, you know, going back to kind of coping strategy, um, is there some, some flavor there that <sighs> acquiring HIV takes away the fear that you'll get it mm -hmm. living in you know it, well once you've once you've got hiv then you can then you can stop trying to not get it and stop trying to control yourself and be safe etc 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 um very very comp again you know people are complex and our sexuality is all wrapped up in our anxiety and and our fears Mm -hmm. The um, another question that I have that I'm curious about your take on is sex education uh, and uh, spe specifically in, in schools and age appropriate sex education. That's a heated topic. <laughs> it's a very difficult topic. Uh, you know, there's questions of can we trust these public schools? Is it any of their business uh, to go beyond strict biology? Because now that sexuality is uh, connected with a lot of gender concepts and identity and so on and so forth, uh, to what degree are we pushing children down paths that they don't necessarily need to go? And uh, so there's just a lot of questions. And I'm just wondering, generally, what are your thoughts on that? And how can we spot good sex ed as opposed to grooming sex ed, uh, if grooming sex ed is uh, a salient concept to you? Um, in the Netherlands, they start sex education for children around age five and seven. And um, even with young children, they're showing them images of what adult um, males and females look like nude. Not not in sexual ways. I mean, this is this is age appropriate. And they're not talking to kids, you know, at age and five and seven about anal sex and stuff like that. But as kids age, they are talking more progressively about um, more sophisticated aspects of sexuality. And the Netherlands has lower levels of sexual assault, lower levels of teen pregnancy, and lower levels of sexually transmitted infection than the United States. Um, we, we have this idea, you know, across the board. Well, if you don't talk about something, it won't happen. Um, but clearly not talking about sex doesn't work, right? The same as suppressing thoughts of sex. We're just gonna make it more, more powerful. Um, and unfortunately now we do have the problem that um, if you don't teach kids about sex, then what do they do? 
they go to pornography on the uh, on the internet where they can see what they think is sex and the a lot of the work i do these days is around pornography and its effects and the thing is that young people who think that pornography is realistic are more likely to learn unhealthy lessons and and experience negative effects from pornography because they don't know what real sex is they don't know about negotiation and honesty and communication um people who young people who watch you know modern pornography are more likely to engage in for instance non-consensual choking during sex that's one of the things that that has exploded in the past five ten years debbie herbenick is a, a indiana researcher with extraordinary data on this um showing that people who watch pornography more young people who think pornography is realistic are more likely to engage in um, rough sex behaviors without asking for or negotiating consent. Just assuming it or? Yeah, or, just assuming. Not assuming. even getting off on doing it non-consensually, just right. not even realizing that it's That's right. yeah. an issue. And so I frankly regard our society's approach to sex education as criminal levels of n neglect. We don't let kids learn to drive by watching Fast and the Furious. And if we did, we shouldn't be surprised when they died in flaming car wrecks on the highway because, you know, they're driving cars 120 miles an hour that can't handle it and they can't they can't navigate and control. Hmm. Now, I think that there there certainly are problems in sex ed because the but the issue is not sexuality. The issue is how goddamn polarized and politicized all of this has become um because it, you know the uh, a lot of sex sex ed right now it, it's always on one side or the other it's always um oh we need to teach all kids to be queer and all kids to be trans and accept you know any kind of sexual behavior and blah, 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 hyper left but the hyper right is also there teaching kids to be afraid of any sex other than sex in marriage mm -hmm. and teaching kids that condoms don't work and um, that they should wait till marriage and both sides suck. Would it be possible for us to navigate some middle? Mm -hmm. um, you know, my, my daughter um, in high school, she brought home some of her um, handouts from sex ed and uh i mean even though new mexico where i live is you know is a state that mandates uh comprehensive sex sex education some of the material in there was grossly inaccurate and oh, really? in, intended to promote kind of fear um uh you know thing a rat, talking about you know um sex offenders talking about you know equating pornography and heroin um and i'm looking at it going are you kidding me but here's the thing very few states in the country mandate that sex education be scientifically accurate so they may mandate comprehensive sex ed but they don't mandate that it be accurate hmm. well that's kind of a problem because now then we have to rely on the values of the people creating that material whatever those values may be whatever those values may be yeah the the interesting thing though and again it's the same tension between the human and the the human organism and the human being is that going strictly scientific going strictly bio biology doesn't teach you all the things that you should know because first and foremost this is another human being that you're engaging with this uh, just let's let's assume there's only two people involved that's another human being what is that human being feeling what are they thinking uh, having a psychological insight is very necessary to understand all the functioning that's going on there it's not just a biological thing because we're not just bio i mean we're we're biological but we're incredibly crafted by our nature um to have so many different facets so leaving that off the table uh or, you know, entering into a uh, conversation around consent that's not contractual, but is actually psychologically informed, I think is tied into having some sort of literacy that you can only gain from human experience or from 
great books. Like, like getting into understanding how the human mind works is probably a part, if we want to be really comprehensive about sexuality, we need to be comprehensive about the human being and constellate sexuality among a wide breadth of the human. Yeah. And, and that wide breadth, I mean, um, the, uh, again, recognizing none of this stuff is black and white or simple. Um, you know, during the, during the Me Too movement and, and, and the, you know, the, the hyperbolic attention around these issues and, uh, you know, women who were saying things like, um, I said yes, but you should have known that I really meant no. Um, there, which I, I, I can understand the humanity of that. I can understand how I would end up in a situation where I'd say no when I really meant to say no, where I, where I said yes and really meant to say no or wanted to say no. Mm-hmm. However, putting the burden on the person getting ready to be sexual with them to, to identify that requires that person to be incredibly sophisticated at reading your cues. And I have many patients who are on the autistic spectrum and they listened to that and said, holy shit, I can't do that. I can't read your cues. And if I can't, if I can't accept that a yes from you means yes, then, oh, my God, I don't know what I can do. Mm. Hmm. So I, I mean, I, 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 I mean, you, you probably get, I mean, I, I, I am quite a centrist because I, as a therapist, I live in the gray zone. Mm-hmm. As a therapist, I, you know, humans are gray, and and I to be able to understand and connect and help a person, I have to get down in in the gray and be messy. Mm-hmm. I I hate the black and whites on both sides that simplify these incredibly complex and individualized issues. Mm-hmm. You say yourself that you're well, you, you call yourself a centrist, but you, you can be spicy too. You're not. <laughs> Me? I don't know what you're talking about. (laughs) So do you have, um, so you have a practice, you have some books, do you have a product that you're working on? Do you have content that you put out there? Do you have a blog or or a podcast or do Um, you do tours, sex tours or something? uh, Kind of D all the above. I mean, I I never got around to doing a blog or I mean a podcast. I, I have a blog though on psychology today that I've been writing since 2010, I think actually. Oh, wow. And I've got... Uh, 15 million readers on there. Um, I mean, it's huge. Um, I, and and, and you know, I write a piece about it every month. And, you yeah. know, like some some of them get a lot of attention. Some of them don't. Um, I've got a couple of be- I wrote this one piece on the psychology of anal sex that it, that piece alone has been read two million times, hmm. um, which is just hysterical. What are they thinking? Um, yeah, right. Yeah. Um, Go in where the sun don't shine. That's right. David and why? Lee. Why? <laughs> why are they so? Why is he so obsessed with my butt? Right. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I've been writing on there for years. Um, and I do trainings um, around the world at this point for therapists. I supervise sex therapists. I, I train therapists how to be more aware around sexuality. A lot of those trainings are with a group that I, I partner with called the Sexual Health Alliance. Um, and they're a group that really is committed and dedicated towards um, helping um, helping us produce therapists that can work mm-hmm. more effectively around sexuality issues. Mm-hmm. So I do a lot of work with them. I'm kind of writing another book. I've written three books and, um, you know, <sighs> A book, writing a book is kind of, you know, it's a strange narcissistic kind of endeavor. I mean, you generally don't get very much money out of it. Um, it's a labor of love, but it's a ticket to credibility. People introduce you as the author of so-and-so and everybody goes, ooh. Um, <laughs> I'm exploring writing a book about uh, professional sexual misconduct, um, uh, professionals, therapists, teachers, politicians, police. <laughs> that have sex with people they're not supposed to. And um, I want to, I want to present their stories, the, the, them as humans that, you know, that, that they're not just, they're not just black and white evil people um, who got caught, but they're, you know, um, like, you know, there are these 23 year old teachers and female teachers in Texas that keep getting in trouble for having sex with the teenage male students. And you look at these women and 
many of them are attractive, but they have a history of not feeling um, on par with males that they date. They feel kind of dominated or challenged by those men. And these younger males that are, you know, coming on to them, there is a power differential that yeah. is flipped from what those young women experience normally. Yeah. And if we start thinking about it in that way, we can start maybe then understanding how we teach people to make better decisions and we prevent some of these unhealthy behaviors. But I'm having trouble finding people to interview with me about it, even though this happens a lot. But there's so much shame around it that people don't want to talk. Oh, really? Yeah. Hmm. How? That is uh, kind of one of the subtle... Um, strategies that I'm taking by producing a series on gender sexuality and transition and all the associated issues, like just trying to have conversations about it, even though it, the way that people respond to the conversations, the way that people want to have the conversations, it's, it's rough waters, but being, being mature about it goes a long way to helping us understand and then accept the variations and the weirdness there and then put that weirdness yeah. in its place. I, I guess honor, even just honor the perverse that's inside of us and then put it in its place and be able to be yeah. intentional with it rather than controlled by it. Well, I mean, one of the things that I've learned being a sex therapist and dealing with these issues is that, um, I'm no longer afraid of other people's sexuality. Um, that I recognize that um, there is incredible diversity of sexuality and that just because somebody else's sexuality doesn't mirror mine, doesn't make theirs wrong and mine right. It doesn't make me afraid of, of them. I Now, if... I, frankly, I'm more afraid of a person who is highly narcissistic and has low empathy and doesn't care about the rules. I'm more afraid of that person than afraid of a person who sits in my office and says, you know, I'm I'm really struggling with these fantasies about raping somebody. I don't want to do it. I don't know why I have those fantasies. Um, I'm less afraid of that person. Hmm. And in the process, you maybe loosen up the like you were talking about shame turning into self-hatred or fear also turning into self-hatred uh and and there's a way of loosening up the conversation so that people can recognize these behaviors and and then make better choices or make the right choice yeah i mean as you just said a moment ago um there's something there's something powerful about talking about this stuff Um, when you put it out there in the airwaves between two people, um, and now we get to look at it. Mm -hmm. That's what therapy is. Yeah, put it out, put it on the table in between us. Let, 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 let's talk about what it feels like to have those words come out of your mouth. Hmm. How did it, uh, what did it feel like to speak with me? Speaking of words coming out of your mouth, did you? <laughs> did I satisfy you as an interviewer? Yeah, actually, you have a unique, <laughs> you have a unique, unique style. I mean, I like the way you just kind of jumped in, um, and we. I'm not fishing for compliments. I was just making a joke about. No, I uh, being it, meta. Eh, no, I mean, you're talented, and narcissistic enough to know it. <laughs> the pretty eyes. Oh, what are you up? Um, is there anything? Um, I guess it, we, 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 we spoke about the judo aspect or the Brazilian judo. I was just, uh, I like to end the, the episodes with a uh, little weird things that, that the guest does or, or something, uh, orthogonal, which I'm not supposed to use anymore to, to their normal practice. Like, uh, but I guess you like to roll around in the dirt with, with other yeah. dudes. Yeah. 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 I like to, I like to get sweaty and, and, and train. Yeah. I, I have the uh, unbelievable opportunity that um, uh, in Albuquerque is the home of what's called Jackson Wink. Uh, um, uh, it's a, it's an MMA gym um, that has trained some of the top UFC fighters in the world. Tonight it's Friday uh, from I think six thirty to eight, we have a, a collaborative uh, training session where we train Nogi 
um, uh, with my school, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, with these MMA fighters. And it's cool. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm almost 50. Um, I've got one hand. I was born with one hand. And, um, uh, and, and these guys see me and they think, yeah, okay. Um, and then I beat the crap out of them <laughs> and I get to, I get to submit these 23, 24, 25 year old guys who all they do is work out and train and they see me, this old cripple, um, and, and I fuck them up. And it's kind of fun. Um, it's very, uh, uh, it's very, you know, um, feeding to my ego. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm, yeah, it's a unique experience. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, I, that's got to be so fun uh, to, to put those young guys in their place. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and you know, and, and I've been, I mean, I've been training jujitsu 16, 17 years and I was a wrestler yeah. before that. So, you know, so I've got, I've got some good skills, but, but I also, you know, I, first I, I humble them and then I teach them, yeah. um, you know, cause I'm a natural teacher. And so, so I always use it as an opportunity to, to try and help people now, um, learn some skills, same as I do in therapy. Mm-hmm. Doctor, it was wonderful to speak with you. Thank you for, uh, thanks for agreeing to come on. Uh, I, I'd like to have another conversation because we didn't even really talk about pornography. That's a big topic. Um, uh, we could have a whole other conversation on that, hopefully at some point. Yeah, pornography and trans issues and gender issues. I mean, it's all, it's all very nuanced and complex. Um, mm -hmm. Happy to come back and talk. Thanks for having me.